items, and you can also get those. We are asking for a gift to go along with the CDs, DVDs, and USB. This little book is my free gift to you. Also, let me mention that I've got my living commentary. I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible, and uh, it's just powerful. And I've got a lot of stats on here and a lot of Greek and Hebrew words defined that that's the reason I'm using this. And we do have that uh, commentary available to you, and we'll be giving out information at the end of the program. So I started on Monday talking about in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer in verse 2 is, God forbid. Absolutely not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So Paul gives two reasons in this sixth chapter of why we don't live in sin. First of all, it needs to be pointed out. I've made this point. I'll just mention it in passing. But most people today would never have this question come up. Can we just live in sin because of the grace of God? Because grace isn't taught the same way that Paul taught it. If you teach grace the way that Paul teaches it, then you are going to have to constantly say, or, am I just saying that you can go live in sin? And absolutely not. That's not what we're saying. But if God isn't punishing us, once you get born again, if all of your punishment was placed upon Jesus, well, then what is the motivation for you living holy? The way that the church, and I'm using church here uh, in a loose term, it's not necessarily the true body of Christ, but the religious people who claim to be Christians primarily have been teaching that the way, the reason we should live holy is because God is going to reject us and punish us. And that is the motivation for living holy. And some people, the extreme Pentecostals, will teach that any time you sin, the slightest little sin in your life, you lose your salvation, you're backslidden. And if you were to die before you get that sin repented of and confessed, you'd go to hell, even though you might have been living for God for 50 years. You have an unconfessed sin in your life, and if you die, you'd go to hell. That's an extreme, a lesser interpretation, but it's the same principle is what the evangelicals teach, that no, you don't lose your salvation. You'd still go to heaven, but you'll lose all of the benefits of your salvation. He won't love you. He won't answer your prayer. He won't uh, flow through you. He won't use you. And so it's still a fear, maybe not of ultimate rejection, but a fear that I can't have fellowship, relationship with God as long as I've got any problems in my life. When you start taking that motivation away and tell people that no, all of your sin, past, present, and even future sin has been paid for and that God is dealing with you by grace, not based on your performance, people that the only reason they have been living holy is because they feared rejection are going to say, well, can I just go live in sin? Well, absolutely not. But it's a logical question and sad to say, there's not a lot of churches that are preaching the gospel anywhere close to the gospel that this question even arises. But man, there's just so many people that hammer sin all the time. I also am against sin, but not because God is going to reject me, but because of two reasons right here in this sixth chapter. The first one that he gives is how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? The way we would say this today is, don't you know this? Don't you understand this? In other words, this ought to be, some, this is elementary. And yet the average Christian does not know that we are dead to sin. The average Christian does not know that we were baptized into Jesus' death. In verse 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, when you read this, again, our religious traditions make the word of God of none effect, is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 13. And so when most people read this, the word baptism just immediately makes them think of water baptism. And so they think, well, does this mean that when I was water baptized that this took place? If you go over to Hebrews chapter 6, it mentions that there are baptisms plural. There's more than one baptism. 
Water baptism is one thing. But then it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, it talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes us into the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus went on and said that I have a baptism to be baptized with, and he was talking about a baptism of, of suffering and crucifixion. So there's many baptisms. This isn't talking about water baptism. This is talking about that the moment that a person gets born again, they are immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. The word baptized, it's a Greek word, Baptizo, I think is the way you pronounce it. And when the King James Bible was translated, the way that the church was administering water baptism was by sprinkling. And, you know, they still do this in some churches today. They have these little fountains and they'll take a baby. In the first place, infants aren't supposed to be baptized. That's totally wrong. Uh, you can see in Acts chapter 8 that Philip was talking to the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch was ready to receive salvation. And he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And he says, if you believe with all of your heart, you can be. So that shows you that baptism is only appropriate. Water baptism is only appropriate after a person has believed with all of their heart. An infant cannot believe with all of their heart. Infant baptism is not biblical. And I know that that upsets some people, but that's just the truth. And Galatians 4, 16 says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? It's the truth. Water baptism is useless. All you're doing is getting a kid wet. But the reason that they translated it baptize, it's actually in transliteration of a Greek word is because at the time that the King James Bible was translated, the dominant way of doing water baptism was to sprinkle, not to immerse. The word baptizo means to immerse. It says that John the Baptist went and he was at the Jordan because there was much water. You don't need much water if all you're going to do is sprinkle. He was dunking them. Amen. The word baptize or baptizo in the Greek means to immerse. And so because it was against the traditions of the church back in the 1600s when the King James was translated. They didn't want to just, you know, say sprinkle because it doesn't mean sprinkle. It means to immerse is what the word baptizo means. But rather than say something that would offend people and go against the religious traditions, they just said baptize. They made up a word. They transliterated baptizo into the word baptize. But it means to immerse is what it's talking about. This isn't talking about the water baptism that you do as a sign of the fact that you have converted and that you've made Jesus your Lord, which Jesus told us to go and baptize in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. So water baptism is a part of what we are supposed to do, and we were commanded to do it. But this is talking about baptism by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it says, when that happens, we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, if you look at the wording here, the baptism into the death of Jesus Christ is an accomplished fact. It's, it's presented as it's already done. It says, we are buried with him by baptism into death. But then it says that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk. Notice the death to sin is an accomplished fact, but whether we walk in that or not and see it manifest in our life is something that should happen, but it's not automatic. You could say it this way, we are automatically dead to sin. We have died to sin is what these verses are saying. But whether or not that manifests itself in our thoughts and in our actions is dependent upon us knowing the truth. Again, I refer to what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. 
but it's only the truth you know that makes you free. What we don't know is killing us. And the average Christian does not understand that our nature was completely changed. This old man is dead. This old sinful nature is dead, and it does not resurrect from the dead every morning and come back. It is dead, and it is gone. The title of this little booklet is The Old Man is Dead, and then underneath it says, Goodbye and Good Riddance. <laughs> and I like that. Man, you need to understand that that sinful nature that caused us to commit acts of sin is now gone. And somebody's saying, I mentioned this on the program yesterday, but most people's objection to what this says, that our old man is buried with him and it's dead, most people's objection is not theological, it's practical. They look and still see that, man, they can get angry, they can get mad, it seems like that there's easy, it's easy to go live in sin and it's harder in some ways to live uh, righteous. And so some people just on a practical level say, well, man, I'm not dead to sin. This doesn't mean you're incapable to sin, but it means that your born again spirit is incapable of sin. Your spirit now has been changed and your spirit is identical to Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Man, that is so powerful. You are one spirit. In the Greek word for one, there is H-E-I-S, hes, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, here's God and here you are like a little God. You've got a little bit of God in you. You've been born again, but you're just a little baby born again and here's the fullness of God. No, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. We're identical to Jesus in our spirit man. You've got a brand new spirit that has no corruption, no sin. It's not even capable of sin. Let me turn over and read this first to you. I'm going to have to read this because I might not quote it correctly. But over in 1 John chapter 3, th this is an amazing passage of Scripture that most people struggle with. But 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What in the world does that mean? Most people just look at this and they, they, it, their brain just goes tilt. Like, this can't be true. I know I'm born of God, and yet I can sin. And yet this says that if you're born of God, you can't sin. What does it mean? Well, the only way that I've ever heard people try and interpret this is to say it's talking about habitual sin. In other words, if you were an alcoholic before you got born again, you might get drunk once, you might take a drink once, you might do it twice, but you won't just continue to habitually sin. If you were a drug addict, you might take a hit of something one time or something. You might struggle a little bit, but you won't habitually sin. You'll eventually overcome that. There will be a change. That's how most people try and interpret this when it says you cannot sin. But if you're saying that this is just referring to habitual sin, well then, what are you going to do with gluttony? Because gluttony is habitual sin. Did you know that you can't get fat overeating one time? To get fat, you have to overeat over and over. It has to be habitual. Now, I'm not trying to condemn anybody who's overweight, but I'm saying that if you're going to say that this is habitual sin, then you'd have to say that all fat people cannot be born again because they habitually overeat. They habitually sin. You could eat until you literally pass out. You couldn't handle anymore, and you might gain two or three pounds, but you aren't going to be 100 pounds overweight just sinning one time and overeating one time. If you are overweight, it's because you habitually sin. You habitually eat more than your body needs. And again, some people are going to be upset thinking, I'm condemning you. I'm not condemning anybody who's overweight. I'm overweight. I know I should be at least 10 pounds less than what I am, and I'm working on it. I'm 40 pounds less than I was 15 or 20 years ago, and I've kept it off all that time. 
I'm not condemned and I'm not condemning you, but I'm saying that this is not talking about just habitual sin. It says in verse 9, Whosoever is born of God cannot commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This isn't talking about your physical actions. This is talking about that born again part of you. The only part of you that is born again is your spirit. When you come to Jesus, your physical body isn't born again. Your mental, emotional part, what the Bible calls the soul, is not born again. But in your spirit, you are born again. That's what it talks about. It says, whosoever is born of God. The only part of you that is born of God is your spirit, this new man. The old man is dead and you got a new man placed on the inside of you and it can not sin. What a radical statement. Man, that is powerful. That is powerful. And yet most people don't understand this. They don't believe it. And because of it, they aren't reaping the benefit of it. So your spirit can't sin, but your physical body, your mental, emotional part can sin because it was programmed by your sinful nature that you had, that you were born with. Now, some people manifest that sinful nature different than others because they're fearful of things, because of the environment that they live in, because of the consequences that would come and stuff like that. You see varying degrees of sin in people's lives, but it all stems from the fact that they were born with a sinful nature. It's that sinful nature that is causing these sins. When you get born again, the sinful nature is gone. This is what he's saying right here. The reason we don't live in sin is because we are dead to sin. Don't you know that we were buried with him by baptism into death? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And look at this in verse 5. This is Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, which the previous verse says we were if you got born again, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And in verse 6, it says, knowing this. Now, if you just were to stop in verse 5 and put a period there, which it doesn't have a period, it has a colon. If you were to just put a period there and say that if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, period. Well, then that wouldn't be accurate. It would be accurate if you were talking about eventually when we get to heaven, we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. But in the earth, it's not automatic that that resurrection life manifests because in verse 6, it says you have to know this. You have to know something. In other words, the death to sin, the old man dying to sin is an accomplished fact. But whether that influences your actions and your thinking, whether you see the benefit of it in your life is dependent upon knowing this. And what he goes on to say in verse 6, he says that our old man is crucified with him. That's what I'm talking about. The old man is dead. You have to know that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And he's going to continue in these next few verses and just say some things here that, I mean, just nails this down that it is an accomplished fact. I'm running short of time today and I'm not going to be able to say all that, so I encourage you to please listen in to the rest of these programs and also get this material. But let me just point out, he says that our old man is crucified with him. The old man is dead. You don't have to kill the old man. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, your old man, that sinful nature is what we're referring to as the old man. It is dead. It is gone. It is non-existent. And the only thing that is still causing you to yield to sin is an unrenewed mind. You don't understand what has happened to you. If you fully were to change your identity and quit identifying as I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, but instead, you begin to say, I was an old sinner, but I got saved by grace. And now I have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In my spirit, I'm as righteous and as holy and as pure as Jesus is. And I know some people think that's, that's blasphemy. 
It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, where it says, Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I believe it's verse 30, it says, Jesus is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. You'll often hear people say, well, all of my righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. And that's talking about self-righteousness. If you're just talking about my personal actions, my personal thoughts, well, then yes, all of my righteousness is like a filthy rag. But if you're talking about the born-again part of me, my new spirit, it is a, it was created in righteousness and true holiness. And according to 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus is my righteousness. And so if you're talking about who you are in the spirit and you say, well, I'm, my righteousness is like a filthy rag, you would be calling Jesus a filthy rag. No, in the spirit, your righteousness is as pure and as holy as Jesus because it's his righteousness that was given unto you. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, I don't want to be found having my own righteousness, which is of the law. That's talking about self-righteousness, his actions and his thoughts. But I want to be found in him having the righteousness which is of God by faith. There is a faith righteousness that comes as a gift of salvation. But then there is this self-righteousness that profits you nothing when it comes to God. You have to have self-righteousness to relate to people and to stay out of trouble with the law. But when it comes to God, your self-righteousness is like a filthy rag. But when you repent and receive salvation, Jesus becomes your righteousness. And uh, man, I'm out of time. I'm just getting to where there's some great things to say. I encourage you to please get this little book. It's a freebie that we're giving to people. It's 55 pages. And then we've had uh, CDs, DVDs, and a USB that has the audio and video from these television programs. And we are asking for a gift of some amount for the CDs, DVDs, and the USB. So if you'll listen to our announcer, he'll give you all of the information. But I encourage you to please get this. Man, this will change your life if you understand the things that I'm talking about. So listen to our announcer as he gives you all this information. Please call or write today and join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. I grew up in a Christian home and my parents were missionaries. I've seen miracles and God's goodness from the time I was really small. But when I was six years old, I started dealing with fear that was really heavy from that time on. But when I was 12 years old, my cousin gave me a little scripture card that he had written for me, and it was Joshua 1.9. And around that same time, I decided to take reading my Bible seriously. And a few months later, I realized I was completely free. The heavy moments of fear and nightmares were completely gone. Karis has solidified my relationship with God and the word that he began teaching me when I was so young. Carrie Pickett's The Love of God course has changed my life. I realize now how much God loves me and everything He did so that I can live a life of victory and freedom. I just know who He is and that He'll never leave me or let me down. I'm completely dependent on Him in every situation. He truly has set me free because of His great love and His goodness. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome to hear Melissa's testimony? And it was the Word of God that changed her. And that's what Karis Bible College is all about. It's not just my ministry. You heard Melissa mention Carrie Pickett's teaching on the love of God. We have so many powerful instructors. Lives are being changed and we have over 600 people who applied for school who didn't show up and said it was because they couldn't find housing. So we are in the process of building housing. It's expensive. We need people to help us. And if you've been blessed and if you want to help us reach out to these people who want to come and just can't find a place to stay, I encourage you to go to awmi.net slash campus and you can see an artist rendering of the place. You can also sign up and become what we call a foundation builder, a person who gives on a regular basis to help us build out our Karis Bible College. Check it out at awmi.net slash campus. Am I a mistake? Why do I still deal with depression? Why does life feel meaningless? Have I wasted my life? Is it too late, late for me? God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. If you've got any problem in your life, it's really because you don't understand fully what God has done. This word is the greatest gift that God has ever given us because this is how we know Him.
I'm promising you, preparation time is never wasted time. Regardless of what you feel that God has called you to do, you need to be prepared. Andrew is offering his booklet, The Old Man is Dead, as his free gift to you today. This offer is limited to one free booklet per household and is available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. This teaching on the old man is dead is just awesome, and I really encourage you to get these products. You need to study this. It doesn't just come easily. You're going to have to renew your mind, and I've got this free booklet entitled The Old Man is Dead, 55 pages, and then we have CDs and DVDs that were taken from my television teaching, and then this is a USB that has the audio and video on it, and I believe it would really help you, so please take advantage of this teaching. Andrew's complete series, The Old Man is Dead, is available as a newly updated CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available when you contact us. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God, and is available.